everyday events move naturally in one direction, downwards. But chemical reactions appear to operate in two directions. Under one set of conditions, reactions move forward. Under another set of conditions, the reaction appears to stop. And given the right circumstances, reactions can reverse, products can disassociate, and raw materials climb back on the shelf. Even harder to swallow, chemists would have us believe that both forward and reverse reactions happen at the same time. As colorless dinitrogen tetroxide is warmed, it begins to dissociate into reddish-brown nitrogen dioxide. And if nitrogen dioxide is cooled, it reacts to form colorless dinitrogen tetroxide. Left alone to reach the same temperature and pressure, the reaction appears to stop with a mixture of both nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen tetroxide in each flask. But chemists would like us to believe that the reaction has not stopped. Instead, millions of reactions operate in one direction to balance out millions operating in the other. A condition they call dynamic equilibrium. If this is so, we need a model that explains how the individual molecules are behaving. Let's combine one mole of colorless hydrogen gas and one mole of purple iodine gas in a one liter flask. Heat it to 445 degrees Celsius. The purple color begins to fade, indicating that iodine is being consumed. Eventually, the gas becomes almost colorless and remains so. Balancing the equation, we would expect the reaction to produce two moles of hydrogen iodide. On analysis, however, the flask actually contains only 1.6 moles of hydrogen iodide, 0.2 moles of hydrogen, and 0.2 moles of iodine. Has this reaction actually stopped? Or has it reached dynamic equilibrium with ongoing reactions in two directions? Let's look at a collision model based on the kinetic molecular theory. The kinetic molecular theory proposes that molecules are in constant motion. So every individual molecule undergoes endless collisions. The energy of this motion is bound up in several forms, such as rotation, vibration, caused by the movement of atoms within the molecule, and translational, or straight-line motion through space. As heat is applied to any molecule, the heat energy is transferred into kinetic energy. Now let's consider how two molecules might meet and react. If they lack enough energy, they simply bounce off each other. With more energy, but the wrong angle of attack, they do the same. But with sufficient energy, at the right angle, they react. Hydrogen and iodine form hydrogen iodide. Of course, Two hydrogen iodide molecules may also meet. With sufficient energy at the right angle, they will also react to form hydrogen and iodine. If heat energy can be converted to kinetic energy in individual molecules, this allows hydrogen and iodine a downhill energy slide to form hydrogen iodide. But heat also boosts the hydrogen iodide's kinetic energy and allows it a downhill reaction to reform hydrogen and iodine. And in a mess of molecules, there's no reason why both reactions 
should not go on at the same time. Now, just how does this model explain dynamic equilibrium? Initially, if there is only hydrogen in iodine, only this reaction can possibly take place. The quantities of hydrogen and iodine drop quickly. Naturally, at the same time, the quantity of hydrogen iodide increases rapidly. But as the concentration of hydrogen iodide builds, this reaction speeds up. As fewer and fewer hydrogen and iodine molecules remain to react, this reaction slows down. Finally, the rates of both reactions match. As time goes on, the system reaches a stage where the quantity of hydrogen and iodine remain constant, and there's no further gain in hydrogen iodide equilibrium has been reached. It's a dynamic equilibrium because the reaction may be as vigorous as before, but there is no net change in the concentration of any of the participants. So it merely looks stopped. The forward rate of the reaction equals the reverse rate. This model of chemical reactions forces us to change the way we look at chemistry. If reactions do eventually stop, then this one-way symbol appropriately describes chemical reactions. But if reactions are dynamic, even when they appear stopped, it takes the formation of only a few product molecules to raise the possibility of a reverse reaction. If this is the case, whenever we see this sign, we must mentally see double. Of course, since we can't actually see the molecular activity to prove our model valid, it would be nice to have some experimental evidence of dynamic equilibrium. Let's take a container of hydrogen and iodine at a fixed temperature and pressure and allow it to reach equilibrium. When the reaction appears to stop, we have a mixture of three gases. Carefully separate them and measure the amount of each. Now take a second container under exactly the same temperature and pressure and the same amount of each gas, but with one change. We will use a radioactive isotope of iodine. Since we have already determined that these are the amounts and conditions of equilibrium, no reaction should take place if equilibrium is truly a stop in the reaction. A week later, we should be able to separate out the reactants and find them unchanged. Is this what really happens? Almost. The amounts of the ingredients have not changed, but there is now a significant amount of radioactive iodine combined in the hydrogen iodide clear evidence that equilibrium is dynamic. There is a forward and a reverse reaction, continually exchanging atoms from molecule to molecule. Chemical reactions seem to move in two directions. Indeed, chemists believe that even when they appear to be stopped, both forward and reverse reactions continue, balancing each other out in a state called dynamic equilibrium. By using a collision model, 
we can explain how individual molecules acquire enough energy as motion to undergo one reaction and also its reverse. Just how useful is this rather crude ping-pong model? Here's a puzzle. Store in darkness, hydrogen gas, and chlorine gas. Years may pass, and only a minimal amount of hydrogen chloride forms. But expose them briefly to sunlight, why do some reactions happen more quickly than others? To find simple answers, we ironically need a more complicated model. Consider a mole of hydrogen gas mixed with chlorine in the dark. That's Avogadro's number of molecules, and each of them makes billions of collisions a second. Under identical conditions, we might expect every hydrogen molecule to be identical to every other. And the same for chlorine molecules. And yet, the behavior of some suggests that they are not identical. A very few carry enough energy to create a new bonding arrangement. Therefore, hydrogen chloride is slowly formed. Perhaps it's a mistake to consider these individual molecules identical at all. Let's invest each molecule with a distinguishing characteristic. Call it kinetic energy. And see if we can find evidence that otherwise identical molecules have different kinetic energies. In a partial vacuum, two disks are attached to a common axle. Tin is heated until it forms a vapor. The disks are rotated at high speed. And the tin vapor diffuses from the chamber, passing through the slit. If all the molecules moved at the same speed, they should arrive at the disk on the same spot. But that's not what happens. The fastest molecules arrive first. In other words, those with the highest kinetic energy. Those with lower kinetic energy arrive later. Transfer this evidence to a slope representing energy. Like skiers on a hill, there are a few high energy hot doggers. Many middle of the road skiers in the middle of the hill. And a few low energy duds shiver at the bottom. Adding more energy to the system will bulldoze the entire population further up the hill. But the distribution pattern of energies remains somewhat similar. This pattern suggests a crude way of explaining the rate of a reaction. Find the point on the slope above which the molecules have enough energy to react. Those above this energy threshold have what is called threshold or activation energy. If few have the activation energy, the reaction proceeds slowly. Add enough energy to bulldoze many above the threshold and the reaction will speed up. A nice idea, but alas, still not sufficient to explain why hydrogen and chlorine explode. A tiny squirt of sunlight energy is far too small to move the entire population over the barrier. Yet, in reality, somehow they seem to find their own way over the top and into a reaction. But how is this possible? Our model, it seems, is still too simple. We have so far ignored the fact that the downhill energy slide of reacting molecules releases energy which influences other molecules. Let's try a slightly more complex model, a chain mechanism that describes how kinetic energy is acquired and passed on to other molecules in a reaction. For example, one lazy chlorine molecule 
with little kinetic energy is struck with a photon of light energy coming through the window. It absorbs the energy and the molecule breaks apart. A nearby hydrogen molecule is then torn apart when struck by one of these chlorine atoms to form hydrogen chloride, releasing energy and an extra hydrogen atom. This activated hydrogen atom may collide with a chlorine molecule, creating more hydrogen chloride and freeing chlorine to continue the cycle. Sooner or later, an atom will meet its mate, ending the chain. Because of this chain mechanism, a small input of energy can carry a few molecules over the reaction threshold, releasing more energy, which may be recycled to provide activation energy for still more molecules. If enough energy is input, and in turn released by the formation of new molecules, sufficient energy may become available for the reaction to become self-sustaining, even violent. Which explains how this becomes this. A graph of the energy pathway, followed by reaction, can help us understand not only the rates of reaction, but the difference between exothermic and endothermic reactions. No reaction can take place until this amount of activation energy is put into the system. The total energy released is this amount. Since the total energy release exceeds the activation energy, the reaction as a whole gives off this much heat. So it is exothermic dead simple, and just as easy now to understand an endothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction is an exothermic reaction in reverse. The only real difference is that the total energy released during the reaction is less than the total activation energy. This heat must be supplied to keep the reaction going. And where is the heat coming from? In this case, from you. You are supplying the energy from your body to push the molecules of the reaction over the threshold. Within every set of reactions, an exothermic reaction fuels a reverse endothermic reaction to eventually balance out in dynamic equilibrium. This more complicated model helps us explain reaction rates and endothermic reactions. Is it all we need? What causes a reaction to balance at just this point and not some other? Suppose we were to play with the concentration of reactants or add pressure. There are many facets of chemical equilibrium still to explore. When a system is held at constant temperature and pressure and closed to all materials, the macroscopic properties seem to indicate that chemical reactions have stopped. Our collision model, however, suggests that the reaction is not stopped, but is maintaining dynamic equilibrium. The forward rate of reaction equals the reverse rate. Under dynamic equilibrium, neither side makes a net gain. In some respects, dynamic equilibrium is a cozy accommodation between reactants and products. 
But what happens to an equilibrium system when it is subjected to stress? One might ask what happens to people when they're subjected to a stressful situation. One way of offsetting an unpleasant situation is to take countermeasures. Exactly the same principle is involved when stress is applied to a chemical reaction. Like any self-evident idea, though, it didn't occur to anyone until it was clearly stated by the French scientist Le Chatelier at the turn of the 19th century. If a system in equilibrium is subjected to stress, the system shifts to relieve the effects of the stress. Let's explore Le Chatelier's notion. What are the stresses that can be applied to a chemical system? Well, it can be heated, a stress we've examined in some detail. Pressure is a stress. And so is the closely related change in volume. Yet another stress is the addition or removal of one of the participants in the reaction. Now, beginning with an equilibrium condition, does Le Chatelier's principle help us to predict how stress will change a reaction? We have seen how the application of heat affects both the forward reaction and a reverse one. But will the application of heat ultimately favor the reactant side or the product side of an equation? Consider the following. One mole of nitrogen gas plus three moles of hydrogen gas form two moles of ammonia and liberate 92 kilojoules. It's the equation for the production of ammonia. This expression indicates that the reaction is exothermic in the forward direction. However, as we know, the equation can be written like this, which means that heat is required to decompose ammonia into nitrogen and hydrogen. So, the reaction can be looked on as endothermic from the reverse direction. In one system, we have two reactions a heat producer, and a heat eater. If we now add heat to the system, which reaction will be favored by this stress? Remember Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium will shift to relieve the stress. Apply heat. Although the entire system absorbs heat, only one of the reactions actually needs heat. The ammonia absorbs heat, and decomposes into nitrogen and hydrogen. And in fact, experimentation shows that more reactants, hydrogen and nitrogen, are indeed produced until a new equilibrium is reached. So, increasing the temperature tends to favor the endothermic reaction. Now, in the same experiment, we will hold the temperature constant and see if we can predict the effects of another form of stress, pressure. Before doing so, we should look at the implications of the equation once more. One mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen produce two moles of gaseous ammonia. Theoretically, if the reaction could go to completion without changing temperature or volume, the pressure would be reduced by one half because half as many molecules would now occupy the same volume. So this reaction tends to reduce the number of molecules. While in the same way, the reverse reaction tends to increase the number of molecules. Which reaction will ultimately be favored if a pressure stress is applied? Well, a mixture of nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia at equilibrium occupies a certain volume. Any part of that volume has a certain number of molecules in it. 
if we squeeze all the molecules into this space by applying pressure, obviously the number of molecules in the space increases. Increasing molecules is the stress. Le Chatelier says we should look for the tendency that opposes this stress. The formation of ammonia reduces the number of molecules. This reaction increases to relieve the pressure stress. And once again, experimentation confirms more ammonia is formed until the reaction reaches a new equilibrium. In this case, the conclusion is a pressure increase favors the formation of fewer molecules. But does this pressure stress affect the equilibrium point of all reactions? One mole of hydrogen and one mole of iodine form two moles of hydrogen iodide. This means that when the reaction moves in either direction, there is never a change in the total number of molecules in the system. Increased pressure can't favor fewer molecules. We would expect no change in equilibrium, and we can test it out in the laboratory with hydrogen and iodine. The presence of a faint tinge of purple in the container indicates some iodine is present at equilibrium. If the temperature is held constant and the pressure increased by a factor of two, no change in the color property should occur because according to our prediction, no reaction takes place. But when we actually try it, horrors. Just the converse, the purple suddenly intensifies. It appears as if Le Chatelier's principle has just crumbled. But wait a minute, is there another explanation? In fact, what we observe is literally an illusion entirely unrelated to equilibrium. We have simply saturated the color purple by reducing the volume the color occupies by 50% much the way the color of a purple pattern on this screen only seems more intense when squeezed into a smaller space. Other measurements, such as massing the gas, will confirm that there was no change in the original equilibrium amounts. Being able to predict the behavior of reactions under changing conditions is vital for practical chemistry, but hardly enough. We also need to be able to predict quantity. How much will be needed? How much can be produced? The French chemist Le Chatelier explained, when a system of equilibrium is subjected to stress, the concentration will shift to reduce the stress. Le Chatelier's principle helps us predict in which direction a reaction will shift when subjected to a stress like heat. At equilibrium, when the temperature of a system is raised by adding heat, the system will shift in the direction that enables it to absorb heat. Conversely, when heat is removed from the system, the equilibrium will shift in the direction that produces heat. Le Chatelier's principle also predicts how a system will react to a change in the concentration of one of the participants in the reaction. If stress occurs by adding too much reactant, it seems logical that the system will respond by creating more products to use up the additional reactants. 
or if a reactant is removed from the equilibrium, we would expect that products will decompose to counteract the stress in order to produce more of the removed participant. Visual evidence in the laboratory confirms that equilibrium systems act in this manner. In solution, a reaction between light yellow ferric ions and colorless thiocyanate ions produce a distinctly deep red ion, an iron thiocyanate complex. The equilibrium expression is this. Now a source of only one of the reactant ions, the thiocyanate ion, is added in the form of crystals of ammonia thiocyanate. The color of the solution deepens. What's happened? The increased concentration of thiocyanate ions reacts with ferric ions to produce more of the iron thiocyanate complex until a new equilibrium is established. Le Chatelier's principle seems to be a practical idea. But how does it mesh with our collision model for chemical reactions? Consider events at a hydrogen iodide dance. Things have reached equilibrium. A few couples, a few singles. Every now and then a lonely iodine meets a lonely hydrogen. And couples form. In another corner, two couples meet and fight, leaving a pair of lonely element molecules again. Suddenly, a bus arrives, loaded with one kind of molecule, hydrogen. Every lonely iodine is in heaven. The chances of a meaningful encounter have gone up enormously. Momentarily, equilibrium shifts to produce more product couples. But this creates more couples who get into fights and decompose into individual elements. Until finally things settle down to a new equilibrium with more couples. Such a collision model, even without the dance floor embellishments, is a comforting support to Le Chatelier's principle. Although it's a comfort to be able to predict how reactions change directions, chemists are really happy when they can quantify an expression. And they're not the only ones. Before a chemical plant can be built, engineers require accurate data to design the facilities which control large-scale operations. Bankers must be certain that a plant will yield a profit. The good news, there's a mathematical expression for Le Chatelier's principle. And even better news for those who hate math. The calculations are dead simple. Laboratory experiments reveal a fixed value for the ratio between reactants and products at equilibrium. Measure the equilibrium results in moles per liter of three experiments under the same conditions. Looks like a mess of numbers, doesn't it? We'll see if we can find something constant. Let's try this ratio. Try it with each experiment. Alas, nothing very encouraging about these ratios. But wait a second. Go back to the original equation. We've left something behind. There were two moles over here. We could write the equation like this. Let's redo our ratio, but using a value for each mole of reactant. This part of the expression can also be represented this way. The product raised to the power of the number of moles in the reaction. Now calculate this value for each experiment. Close enough to a constant value, just what we were looking for. This constant is called the equilibrium constant. 
At 423 degrees Celsius, the equilibrium constant of hydrogen iodide is this. Knowing this constant allows us to shift to huge volumes in an industrial setting to predict mathematically the yield of a reaction at 423 degrees Celsius. From the results of many equilibrium experiments, a general equation can be written. This many moles of substance A react with this many moles of substance B to produce this many moles of substance C and this many moles of substance D. The law of chemical equilibrium is an elegant way of expressing this concept. For this general reaction, the equilibrium constant is calculated like this. Reconsider a hydrogen iodide reaction. An ammonia reaction looks like this. Since convention places the products on the top and the reactants on the bottom, we can estimate the behavior of a reaction at a given temperature with just a quick glance at the equilibrium constant. A very small constant means only a little product of equilibrium compared to the reactants. A constant with a value about one means equilibrium will produce a roughly equal balance between products and reactants. And a very large constant will result in a great deal of product and only little reactant at equilibrium. The equilibrium constant is a powerful and practical working tool for chemists. In the next program, we will see how one man and his understanding of chemical equilibrium changed the course of history in this century. At the turn of this century, two powerful forces were preparing to clash. The British Navy and the German scientific community. Though neither was aware at the time, both would be involved in a life and death struggle for control of one of the most common elements on the face of the planet, nitrogen. For this simple molecule is the stuff of bread and bombs. To begin with, nitrogen is a basic food of plants. But although four-fifths of the air around us is free nitrogen, plants can't use it directly. Nitrogen must be fixed by chemically combining it to other elements forming compounds which the plant can ingest from the soil. The nitrogen fixation process occurs continually in nature. Lightning forms compounds such as nitrogen dioxide. And bacteria in the roots of the pea family can produce the equivalent of two and a half tons of fertilizer per hectare each season. Much of the precious fixed nitrogen which feeds plants is returned to the soil when they die. But Europe at the beginning of the century 
was robbing its soil of fixed nitrogen by intensive harvesting of food. So European countries replaced the fixed nitrogen by importing natural nitrate deposits. Chile supplied the world with two-thirds of this natural fertilizer, and Germany alone bought up one-third of Chile's production, both for agriculture and because fixed nitrogen is the key ingredient in explosives. In the unlikely event of war, the British Navy planned to blockade Germany, deny the Kaiser his source of explosives, and starve the German people into submission. But when war did come, the Allies had not counted on this genius, Fritz Haber, the most patriotic of Germans who would invent the process for fixing nitrogen from thin air. Haber's challenge was to break the strong bond that holds nitrogen atoms together and combine them chemically with what? The nitrogen atom has five electrons in its outer shell. Of several candidates to combine with nitrogen and complete this shell, Haber decided that three hydrogen atoms were the most promising, forming ammonia. By working with the chemical equation for the formation of ammonia, and of course by watching program four in this series, Haber knew that the removal of heat should favor the production of ammonia. But in reality, Haber was unable to detect the formation of even a trace of ammonia. This indicated that either the rate of the forward reaction was extremely slow, or Le Chatelier was wrong. Haber also knew that four volumes becomes two volumes in this forward reaction, which tends to decrease pressure in the container. He encouraged this reaction by applying more pressure to the system to squeeze out ammonia. Foiled again, even under hundreds of atmospheres of pressure and low temperatures, he was unable to produce a whiff of ammonia. Neither Haber nor Germany could wait for such a slow reaction. Haber realized that adding heat speeds up all reactions. If no product is around to interfere, the reaction would run in one direction. The presence of the product ammonia was certainly not the problem at first, so a high temperature could be used to produce ammonia. Haber's enemy was the ammonia itself. As it increased in quantity, the heat began to favor the reverse reaction back into nitrogen and hydrogen until finally an equilibrium was reached with only a small amount of ammonia present. If only a small yield of ammonia was possible, Haber decided to achieve it quickly. He found that uranium and osmium of all the catalysts he tested, produced the greatest increase in the rate of the reaction. From his data, Haber was able to calculate that a compromise could be reached between the rate of the reaction and the concentration of the product in the mixture of gases. At a pressure of 200 atmospheres and a temperature of 600 degrees Celsius, he produced 100 cubic centimeters of ammonia, barely an 8% yield. But the rate of the reaction made the process commercially feasible. In the Haber process, pure nitrogen and hydrogen gas are pumped into a pressure vessel containing a catalyst. Pressure is applied and temperature is raised. The stress on the system is an enormous excess of nitrogen and hydrogen molecules. And as Le Chatelier predicts, the reaction shifts to produce more ammonia molecules, speeded by heat and catalysts. The mixture is continuously drawn off 
before it reaches equilibrium, which reduces the potential yield, but delivers a steady stream of gas to a cooling tower where ammonia is liquefied and separated. The hydrogen and nitrogen, which remain gaseous, are continuously recycled to maintain a steady state. Hydrogen and nitrogen in, hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia out. The net effect is a removal of ammonia molecules, a stress which, as Le Chatelier predicts, is counteracted by a steady reaction to produce more ammonia. The rest was up to German industry. In 1913, their factories produced 7,000 tons of ammonia. By the end of the war, 200,000 tons. So much for the blockade by the British Navy. Haber single-handedly prolonged Germany's war effort by a few years. As a true German patriot, he put his lab to other uses. At the request of the war ministry, he developed and personally supervised the use of chlorine and mustard gas, which nearly routed the Allied armies. In 1919, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his ammonia process and was the only recipient in its history to have the honor contested. Allied scientists were slow to forget the damage he had done during the war. But the greatest insult of all came from his homeland. Haber was hounded from his beloved country for the crime of being Jewish. Distraught, he wandered Europe and died broken-hearted a few kilometers from his beloved Germany. Perhaps history seeks an equilibrium as well. Hundreds of millions now depend for their well-being on agriculture fertilized by the Haber process. Today, Haber is recognized for his mastery of chemical equilibrium and has been restored to his rightful place in the pantheon of science.